All right. Good morning. Praise good morning. the Lord. Praise the Lord. We'll uh, we'll just kind of mumble a little bit until we know uh, some people have logged on. Um, generally, my dad logs on about this time on Sunday morning. So uh, I want to welcome you to Life Family Church. And uh, I want to thank you for coming today. I want to thank you for watching today. I am going to be sharing the Word of God this morning. And as I do, I believe that, uh, as always, he's going to uh, respond to open hearts and open ears. And so right now, we're just going to pray, all right? So, Father, right now, in Jesus' name, I thank you for the Word of God. I thank you that it's alive and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. I thank you, Father God, that the Word of God is the foundation of our life. I thank you that... Jesus is alive and well, and he's here today. We acknowledge the presence of Jesus in this place today. We thank you, Lord God, that he said, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Amen. We know that the book of Revelation, in that book, he said, I am the one who walks among the churches. And so here he is, and we acknowledge him, and we honor him in this place. We thank you for the presence of God. We thank you for the spirit of God. We thank you for the love of God. We thank you for the power of God, the mercy of God, and the hand of God moving today. I pray that every eye and every ear would be open to what the Spirit of God would say to us today. And I pray that in Jesus' name. And if you agree, say amen. 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 All right. Good morning. So today, if you have your bulletins, bulletins, however you want to say it, uh, on the back, you'll see that today I'm going to share a message called Good Old Days. So, um, how many of you lately have heard the phrase, the new normal? Yeah. I hate yeah. that phrase. <laughs> I hate that phrase, yeah. the new normal. But we've been hearing it all over, about everything. Well, this is the new normal. Well, this is the new normal. And, and in some ways, uh, some of that is true. You know, I think about the fact that we, uh, we said goodbye to, to Carl uh, a few weeks back, right? So the first Sunday back here, even though we hadn't been here for a while just because of the shutdown and the illness and everything, uh, Jim and I were walking in the hallways here and we said to each other, we're going to have to get used to this. This is, Carl is gone, you know, this is the new normal for us. Uh, and there's a... There's a longing on the inside of us when we experience a loss. Yeah. Um, and in some situations, it's grief. In some situations, it's just a looking back at the way that things were uh, and, uh, you know, the way that uh, we, the way that your memories work, you associate them with sights and smells and tastes and different things, you know, different phrases, different different pictures you might look at. That's why pictures are so wonderful because they they evoke not just the memory of the actual scene in the picture, but they evoke some kind of emotion out of you. And so I don't know about you, but lately with all this mess going on uh, in this state and in this world and even in my own personal life, uh, sometimes... I'm just like, dude, I wish we were back in the good old days. And then, uh, of course, we are getting older, so Jim and I kind of say, talk about the good old days anyway, and for some of you, that's like way before you were born. <laughs> so, anyway, I'm going to share a message on the good old days, and I've actually preached this here before, so it's not, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not, um, you know, a brand new message I downloaded last night, but it has been something that God has been uh, speaking to me lately, and I know uh, last week I felt was a really timely, timely word for us to bring back what God spoke to us at the beginning of 2020. And if you were not here and you did not watch it or listen to it, I encourage you to do that because God has shown himself faithful to us. Amen. Amen. I did not bring out my notes from January of 2020 to say, look, see, I told you so. I brought them out because the Holy Spirit prompted me saying this is this is coming to pass what God had spoken at the beginning of the year. So I just encourage you to uh, to watch it or listen. It's up on Facebook. It's up on YouTube. And I believe the audio is probably up on SoundCloud. 
by now. So, anyway, we're all in different stages of life and our Christian life. And we are all, every single person in this room, whether you're a child or uh, an adult or um, consider yourself somewhere in between, um, everybody's at a different stage. And, uh, you know, maybe you're in the early stages of your Christian life. Um, I know for me, I'm, I'm coming up upon 40 years soon, uh, in the next couple years of, of walking with Jesus. 40 years, guys. More than half the world is younger than that. More than half the world is younger. Half of the population of the earth is younger than uh, the amount of time that I've been married in less than two months, I'll be married 40 years. Uh, and then not too long after that, yeah, not too long after that, uh, I'll be a Christian, I'll be a believer, walking with Jesus for 40 years. 40 years. Uh, the Bible actually considered that a whole generation, right? How long did they wander in the wilderness? 40 years. 40 years. Okay? Maybe you've been married 40 years, you feel like you've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. I don't. But I'm just saying, maybe you do, not me. But, um... That's a whole generation worth of time, right? So it's time for a new generation, right? Open a new door into your life. God says, I'm going to do new things, right? Amen. That was read uh, That was read the other night at, uh, at our hour of power, right? Behold, I do new things. Right. Amen? Amen? So maybe you're in the not-so-early stages of your Christian life. Maybe you've been a Christian a long time. Um, but I know, honestly, for me, I need, I need to hear this this morning. I need to be reminded by God of the things that I'm going to share with you today. So even if it's stuff you've heard before, it's okay. You can just humor me. Even if it's something you've never heard before, I want you to open your heart and take it in. All right? So I'm going to have some, we're going to have some interaction. We're missing a few people. I don't know where they went. But anyway. Um, <laughs> So, we're going to have some interaction. I want you to shout back, okay? What thoughts stir in your heart? Not right now. I'll tell you when. What thoughts stir in your heart when you stop and remember the early days after you first came to the Lord? So, can you remember how excited you were in those days? Can you remember when you first got saved? Who can remember when they first got saved? Okay. Everybody should have some kind of recollection, unless you grew up a Christian. And that's, you know, I have some kids, some of my own biological children that actually uh, prayed to receive Jesus when they were like two or three years old. And so they don't necessarily remember uh, that. But I was not, uh, I was not a nice girl. So I was not a Christian. And I can remember when I bowed my knee to Jesus Christ. Uh, so does he. <laughs> so um, it was an absolute point in time. And I was, I was very well aware of what I was doing, and I was cognizant of it, and I was an adult. Um, so, praise God, I don't have to go fishing in the sea of forgetfulness anymore. But I want to prompt you this morning about uh, the good old days. Okay? So, here's my question to you. You can yell it out. Just make sure I hear you. What one word would you use to describe what your Christian life was like in the early days after you first came to Christ or after you were first illuminated. Uh, give me a word. Excited. Excited. Discovery. Discovery. What? Discovery. Discovery. Freedom. 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 Different. Thankful. Different. Thankful. Changed. Changed. Special. Special. Anybody else? Hopeful. Love. Love. Hopeful. Hopeful. Amen. Happy. Amen. All right. Okay. So with um, with those kind of words, uh, those things were are are mostly like emotional, right? Are they bad emotions? Nobody said distressed, depressed, gloom, agony, despair. Oh me! Nobody said any of those things, right? Because once they came to Christ, they were. Excited, happy, felt special, changed, loved, all these different things. They felt these things. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing. Emotions are, are, are important. God gave them to us. And when we first came into the kingdom, 
Nope. Uh, we felt these, these emotions, right? I personally remember the newness of everything. I felt newness, okay? How excited I was. I couldn't keep my mouth shut. You can ask my husband. It was really a pain in the neck because I had to tell everybody that God had saved me and set me free and I was going to heaven. And you might not be, you know. Um, you can ask him for uh, his testimony. Um, thank God for a nagging uh, hey, I guess, in your life. Because all I did from the moment I got saved, and I realized that I was going to heaven, and he was not, was remind him, I just want to let you know that I'm going to heaven, dude, and you're not. And I really want you there with me. Just reminding you that you're a sinner and I'm not. Just saying, in the love of God. Just saying that if you died tonight, you'd go straight down. I'd go straight up. You know? And if you really love me, you might want to think about that because you'd never see me again. Kind of thing. So, that is zeal without knowledge. Okay? <laughs> that is... Um, that is just excitement without compassion. There's no filter there. You know how sometimes when people get close to the end of their life and they lose their filter? I didn't have one to start with. So, <laughs> God gave me one later in life. And you might be asking, like, well, where is it? But don't worry about it. That's something we can talk about later. Okay, so I was so excited and so on fire. And fire is probably the word that I would use for my conversion experience. Um, I was alone in my room and I was so depressed and so fed up. I just said, God, I just give you everything. I am done, I am finished. There's absolutely not one thing that has fulfilled me and I've tried just about everything and there's nothing here that I want. And so God, I just hand you my life and I give it to you. And Jesus came in and set, set me free. He changed me. He, he came in and wiped away the old and gave me the new. Amen? Amen? Set my feet upon a rock. All those things. I was radically saved. And so because of that, uh, in my great desire I, uh, to see other people have the wonderful experience and the excitement and the fire that I did, I made sure that everybody knew that if they weren't saved, they were not going to heaven. So, uh, but honestly... I had people in my life then that were in Jim and, and my life, Jim's life and my life together, uh, that had been praying for me, that said, as soon as you got saved, your face changed. And there was a light on my face. Uh, I looked different. And I can remember a few years later when we realized that we were called to ministry, uh, particularly to the mission field, and how so many things just fell into line for us to get involved uh, in things that we needed to do to fulfill God's plan for our lives. I remember that renewed excitement and fire and vision. Uh, you couldn't keep us away from church. You couldn't keep us away from God's people. We could not get enough Bible studies. We could not get enough Christian worship music. You know, we threw out all the, the secular junk and, uh, and brought in all Christian music. You know, we went to Christian concerts. And uh, at church, we were there every time the doors opened uh, because we couldn't stand the thought of God doing something in the church service and us, us not being there and missing out on it. We just, we were so hungry for everything that we could get. We were so on fire for God. Of course, this is after Jim got saved because he listened to the, uh, the advice of his wife. Uh, but if anybody had a supernatural experience, it was Jim. God just did an incredible thing the night he got saved. And uh, he never looked back and he's never been the same. But we were so on fire for God. And I talk about the early years and the things that God did. And we just saw God do like financial miracles for us. We had no money. And, you know, we'd give everything away. And then God would turn around and give everything back. And just all kinds of stuff. And we were so on fire for God, for his cause for his people and um, we've been under all of us we've been under a lot of pressure lately there's a lot of pressure right now in this 
everything. And you may feel like you're even, like for me, living out where I live, you know, out in the boonies, I don't have, I don't have neighbors for um, a quarter mile down the road, right? So for me, I'm not really touched by a lot of this. Like nobody's setting my building on fire and rioting. You know, nobody comes out, so the police don't come out to my house and check and see if I'm abiding by the rule. You know what I mean? I'm really not touched. Jim has been able to work this whole time from home and make his salary. So for us personally, we've not really been physically in our, in our life touched by this. But man, I'll tell you what, we feel the pressure. Do you feel the pressure? There's pressure. There's pressure. You know, there's pressure from the government overreach. There's pressure from, you know, the things that are on the TV and on the internet. And there's pressure from other people that are feeling pressure. And there's pressure from people that are, like, totally fearful and letting it rule their lives. It's, there's just a lot of pressure. And I want to encourage you today in this message. Um, because we don't need to look back at the good old days and feel sorry that we're not back there. Because I want to tell you what God has told me. That we are living in the most monumental days of history. And things may be hard and there may be a lot of pressure. But God is getting ready to bust loose yes. on this earth. And we are going to see things in a little while. And I just keep hearing this from the Holy Spirit. In a little while. Because I am the kind of person that when I pray, I say, when, Lord, when, Lord, when, Lord, when, Lord. And I hear this today. In a little while. In a little while, in a little while. And I want to tell you today, you may be under pressure and people are just under pressure just because there's pressure in the earth. But I want to tell you that God says in a little while, you're going to see some of the things that he's promised. Amen? You want to see what he's promised? Go back to the Old Testament prophets and see what he's promised. He said, as surely as I live, all the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. As surely as I live, the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Do you know how the waters cover the sea? Completely. And do you know that it goes back and forth and it washes back and forth and it brings things in with it? Brings things in with it, with the tide. And so I want to stand here before you today and encourage you to be at peace and be at rest, because in a little while, you're going to see what God has promised. Amen? Amen. Amen? So, this pressure is not coming from God. But there's something about the enemy that we need to realize. It's coming from your enemy. Uh, but we need to be reminded, and we'll be reminded today. He doesn't necessarily come along and try to kill you instantly. Some people he does, you know. And sometimes he's, he's had his way and they've, they've gone. But he never has the final say because uh, there is no sting in death when you believe in Jesus. Right. Amen? Amen? Jesus has the final word and you have the final victory anyway. But he comes to what? do three things. Ready? He comes to steal, kill, kill destroy. Steal, kill, and destroy. And he may not be able to do that instantly. He may not be able to come up and just take you out. And, uh, and kill you, or steal everything that you have, or destroy everything that you have. He may not be able to do that uh, because we, we don't allow him to. Amen? Yep. But he is not, not going to give up, and he works against God's people any way that he can. Any possible way that he can. So, Galatians 6, chapter 9 says this. And this is my, my word to you this morning. Galatians 6, 9. Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. And I believe that this is the word of the Lord for today. For right now. And there are so many in the body of Christ. There are many out of the body, outside the body of Christ. But there are so many in the body of Christ that are tempted to grow weary right now, right this minute. There are so many in the body of Christ that are ready to throw in the towel. Did you know that right now the suicide, deaths, and the drug abuse is higher than it's been 
uh, because of the pressure that has come down on people. Yeah. The pressure that's in the earth. Let us not lose heart in doing good or doing what's right. For in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. Amen? Daniel 7.25 says this, and you can go back to the book of Daniel. It's actually uh, monumental uh, when it comes to the prophetic things that are going on right now. It says this, he will speak out, he will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the Highest One. He will intend to make alterations in times and in law, and they will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. But the court will sit for judgment, and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated, and destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. Amen. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Our enemy wants to wear us down. Right. He wants to wear me down. He wants to wear you down. He wants to wear my husband down. Yeah. Amen. And we need to make sure that we do not lose heart or courage that says, do not lose courage, do not lose heart, do not faint, because in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. In due time... And God says today, in a little while, in a little while, what you're waiting for, in a little while, it's going to come. It's going to come to pass. Don't give up and don't believe the lie that you will not see it. Because in a little while, you will. So I have a few keys this morning. Concerning not growing weary. It's a hard word for me to say. Not growing weary so that we will reap what God has promised. Amen? Don't lose heart. So, I'm going to give you these keys with some scriptures and you can go home and pray about it and look at it yourself. Alright? Number one key. Number one key. Stick together. Stick together. It is the enemy's strategy to divide and conquer. And if you do not believe that, look outside your window. Every time there is uh, something going on, particularly up at the Capitol, you know, there are, like yesterday, there was a freedom from the mandate rally, okay? I, I watched this. I did not attend. I watched it. There was a freedom from, you know, release us from the mask rally. You, if you saw it on, on, if you watched it live, I looked at some of the live footage, there was a whole row of people uh, with no masks and their American flags and their, you know, I love Jesus t-shirts and their, you know, Patriot t-shirts, all these different things. And then in front of them, there was a line of police and they were each standing one this way, one this way, one this way, one this way. And they were doing that because on the other side of them, there was a group of people shouting obscenities at the police and at the, you know, the people on the other side. They were screaming all kinds of things. And it was nothing but division. It was division. Divide and conquer. So what should be a time of people coming together to uh, fight against an enemy... It was people being divided and just shouting their, their two sides. Now I'm not going to, I don't have to tell you which side I would be on because you know it. Um, so it doesn't matter uh, what side I would be on. What does matter is that divide and conquer is one of the prime strategies of the enemy. He wants to wear you down and if he can't do that, he'll divide and conquer. Yes? And this nation is divided in every way you can think. We are divided. The, the kingdom of God, the church, is divided about little things. Little things. What drugs work, what don't. What should you wear a mask, should you not. Should you do this, should you not. You know, and it's, divi it's dividing the church. Right. Key number 
number one, stick together. United we stand, divided we fall. United we stand, divided we fall. It is his strategy to divide and conquer. Don't fall for it. Don't be deceived. Remember last week we talked about being deceived? Don't be deceived. Jesus said in the last days many will be deceived. You can have your opinions about everything. You know, you can do your research, you can have your opinions, and that's fine. But don't fall into deception thinking that, that the divide and conquer strategy is not, you know, being, being used right now in this earth. Yeah. It'll be used in this earth, it's used in this state, and it's being used in our families. And divide and conquer is the enemy's strategy, not God's. It is a strategy that's used in war against enemies. Prisoners of war are brought in and they're separated from all their group because, because those that take them in and are interrogating them know that if they can divide, they can conquer. They can break one to make him talk. They can divide them and make them think they're the only one and make them think they're all alone and make them think the other ones are saying something that they're not. It is an enemy strategy. Don't fall for it. Hebrews 10, 23 says this. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is what? Faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some. But encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We as the body of Christ have allowed things to come in to divide and they're conquering us. And we need to be wise. Amen? Amen. Because it will, it will, it will open the door for Satan to wear us down. And that's his, that's his highest strategy is to wear down the saints of the Most High. If he can wear us down, he can get a foothold in and he can have his way. So number one, stick together. United we stand, divided we fall. Number two, remind yourself of what God has done for you in the past. This is what the Israelites did. They used that as a pattern in their life, and we should do it. Every time God did something, what did they do? They set up a bunch of rocks, and they called it something that had to do, that referenced what God had just done, right? And so when they did that, they would come around again, and they would see it, and it would remind them, just like what we were talking about, right? The good old days, when God was doing awesome things. Well, God's still doing awesome things. We're just not living where we were. And sometimes we think about the good old days, and we think, if I could just go back to that, life was so much easier then. And if you, if you lie to me and tell me you've never said that, I don't believe you. If you're over 30 years old, I don't believe you. Life was so much easier. Of course it was. Of course it was. Because, number one, your memories of the hard parts aren't brought up, right? And uh, number two, you were, like, younger, and there was less to deal with. And so, yes, of course it was. So, as your life grows and expands and, and gets bigger, you know, and your little kingdom gets bigger, then there's all kinds of opportunity for, for challenges. Remind yourself of what God did for you in the past. Every year in December, I publicly acknowledge being healed by God of uh, chronic fatigue syndrome that I was told by, by an infectious specialist, infectious disease specialist, that at some point I would most likely be in a wheelchair and do not have any more children because it would be dangerous for you. He could not really pinpoint exactly what was wrong with me, but I, but he drew a downward spiral on the board while Jim and I were sitting there and our eyes just got real big because uh, this guy, when you walk into his office, he had a scripture from Isaiah on there about rising up with wings like eagles and, and God renewing you. And then when you go into his office, he drew a downward spiral, spiral and told me, you know, you're going down, you're going down. You'll never be able to work a job and just all these things he told me um, and said your life will your life will take a downward spiral and you will get depressed and see the lady on the way out because we're going to give you a prescription for antidepressant because you're going to get depressed. And on our way out, Jim's like, come on, girl, let's get out of here. You know, so out we went and I, 
I have utmost respect for doctors, uh, but I did not need uh, to be worn down any more than I already was. And so we decided to just go and, uh, and uh, seek out what the Word said, and I was healed. I had uh, a man of God uh, who is a missionary today, and he's actually been here. Uh, I walked into, actually I was carried into a service that he was preaching, and he saw me in the back, and he, and he called me up, and he kind of like helped me up to the front, and he laid hands on me, and from that day forward, I was not the same. And I was not instantly, completely restored and made whole, and it was a journey, but I was instantly and completely healed of whatever the virus was that was attacking me. It stopped. And from that point on, all I had to do was walk into more and more healing and restoration. And God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. Amen. And so you need to remind yourself of what God's done in the past. Not because it's the good old days and you long to be back there, but because if he did it back then, he'll do it now. Amen. He's the same God that was there for me when I, I can't even remember how old I was. Uh, Laurel was not... Laurel was two, so I was right around 30 or 31 years old when this happened, when it hit me. And I was about 34 or so uh, when I came out of it. I was almost all the way out of it, I believe that's right, uh, in about two years. And God healed me, and I publicly acknowledge that at least once a year. Because I believe we need to do that. That's my, that's my memorial. That's my pile of rocks. That's my altar, or whatever you want to call it. For when I was going around, and I was, I was out in the wilderness, and God did something phenomenal, and saved me, and healed me, and set me free, and I, I have a memorial to that. Yeah. Amen? And we need to go back and look at those memorials. Every single time we start pining for the good old days, because these are... The good old days. Because the same God that was there in the good old days is the God that's here now. Amen. The same God that healed me 30 years ago is the same God that I serve now. Amen. The same God that, that took me out of the pit that I was in, in the sinful state, and threw all of my sins into the sea of forgetfulness is the same God that I serve now. Amen? Amen. Remind yourself. Sometimes you need to remind yourself. This is what the Israelites did. Hebrews 10.32 says, But remember the former days when after being enlightened, I love that phrase, being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. Remind yourself of what God has done. Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Amen? So number one, stick together. Number two, remind yourself of what he's done for you in the past. Number three, spend time with Jesus. This might be the most challenging one. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Isaiah 40, 29 says, He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, you guys get tired? Yeah? You get weary, you get fed up, right? And vigorous young men stumble badly. Does that happen? Yeah, absolutely. Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. Somebody actually sent me this in a text the other day. They will mount up with wings like eagles, and they will run and not get tired, and they will walk and not become weary. Did you know there's a difference between being tired and weary? When you work really, really hard physically, or maybe you run on a treadmill, or maybe you're chasing after kids or whatever, you can get <coughs> tired. Okay? You can get tired. It says they will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. 
Becoming weary is what happens when you get worn down. And becoming weary takes a different kind of restoration. A lot of times when we're tired, what do we need to do? We need to get some rest. rest. Yeah, or sleep. Yeah, rest or sleep. Sometimes when we get weary, we need to be uh, invigorated. We need to be renovated. We need to be refilled and recharged. Amen? They will walk and not become weary. It says, those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. And what did God say this morning? He said, just a little while. In a little while. In a little while. Don't become weary. Because in a little while, we're going to see things come to pass. Amen? Amen. All right, so stick together. Remind yourself of what God's done for you in the past. Spend time with Jesus. Sometimes we just have to make an appointment and go do it. Yes? Sometimes we just have to put things away and, and go do it. Sometimes, and I know this doesn't go over really uh, well with some people, because they need their sleep. Uh, but sometimes you need to lose sleep to do this. Because God is gonna, God is gonna give you what so much more during that time than any sleep ever could. And I'm not saying don't ever sleep, and I'm not saying you need to be like me and be crazy and only sleep a couple of hours a night. And I'm not saying that you know you can live your life tired all the time. You need to take care of yourself. The Bible says we need to we need to push. We need to we need to work hard to enter into the rest of God. So you need to sleep. But there may be times. When you hear the voice of the lover of your soul calling you to come spend time with him. And it might be when you were planning on sleeping. And it's well worth losing the sleep. Amen? Amen. Because what you gain is worth so much more than the hour or two of sleep that you lose. It's just like the investment that we were talking about last week. Remember that? You weren't here. You should. You should. Uh, oh, that was the week before. Sorry. We need to invest, and when we spend time with Jesus in prayer and in His presence and on our face before God, we're investing more into our lives than a little bit of sleep ever would. You know, Paul said that. Uh, he said that uh, physical discipline brings a little profit. He didn't say it was worth nothing. He said it brought a little bit. So there's some there's some return on your investment, right? Like, you, you can't see them. I won't show you because you'd get really jealous. But I've got these crazy guns here. <laughs> and it comes from the little bit of investment that I put. Actually, it just comes from carrying babies around for so many years. Uh, that's why this one's so much bigger than this one. Uh, so a little bit. I got a little bit. A little bit of, uh, of gains. Right there. He said, it's worth something. It's worth a little. But he said, but godliness, disciplining and godliness is worth a lot. Amen. Amen? So you really need to have both. You really need to have both. Uh, especially if you want to live a long life and, and uh, be able to pick up the kids and do whatever God tells you to do, you know, in your life. But the investment return on the spiritual discipline goes far beyond the return that we get on the physical. Amen? Amen. Don't throw them both, don't throw one away for the other. Uh, you need them both. But you need the spiritual discipline more. Amen? So discipline your body. Spend the time with Jesus, even if he tells you you actually might need to stay awake for an extra hour. Or get up an hour early. Uh, or turn off the TV. Put away the video games. Turn off the news. Get off Facebook. Put the other books down that you're reading. About the conspiracy theories and all those other things that are going on. <laughs> Triggered. Uh, and spend time with him. 
Those other things aren't bad, but you'll get more, you, you need to put more priority on the spiritual investment. Amen? Amen. Last thing, do whatever you need to do because desperate people do desperate things. Desperate people take desperate measures. Ephesians 2 says this, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write this. The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this. This is the words of Jesus. So when we say this, our ears should perk up. Oh, Jesus is calling. Jesus is speaking. What was that old commercial? Mark with that. What is it? E.F. Hutton, right? When E.F. Hutton speaks, right? People, people listen. listen. Hmm? People listen. People listen. That's right. At my house, when I speak, people listen, but that's because I'm loud enough to wake the dead. Oh. Um, and even then, sometimes they still don't listen. So it's not a hearing problem. It's a listening problem. But anyway, um, this is what Jesus says. So listen. I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not. And you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my sake, and in this have not grown weary. So they've been doing all the right things. But I have this against you, that you've left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you've fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I'm coming to you and I'll remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. <clears throat> he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And to that I say this, desperate people will do desperate things. They will listen to the voice of Jesus. They will read his words and they will do what he says. They will do whatever it takes to receive whatever he gives. Amen? Amen. Amen. Desperate people take desperate measures. And we need to be in a state of desperation. We need to be in a state of if we are not, I don't want to say feeling because feelings come and go, but if we are not living in the place that we were in the good old days when we first got saved, we need to figure out why. The Bible says here, remember where you've fallen from and repent because you've lost your first love. Do the deeds you did at first. He's not necessarily speaking about the things, well, I used to be an usher, so now i got to go back and be an usher because Jesus said, do the deeds I did at first. No. He is saying, you've lost the fire. You've lost the desire. You've lost the, uh, the newness. You've lost the excitement. You've lost the things that you had in the first place Probably because you've grown weary. We need to do what he tells us to do. Amen? Amen. We need to know where we have fallen from. Well, that's why I prompt you in the beginning. The good old days. Remember the good old days? Woo! God was so good in the good old days. We would come to church and, uh, you know, maybe you went someplace that had a full band. That's pretty cool. You know, and had drums. And those drums made you feel excited. And God was doing so many things in your life. And you were telling everybody about Jesus and how good he was to you and how awful you were before you met him and all these awesome things. And you were bringing people to Jesus left and right. You were praying for people that you didn't know. People were getting healed. People were getting saved. God was touching your family. And today, we're more mature. We have more dignity. Today, you know, we, we know the Word of God because we've read it all. 
We've done the, we know how to pray because we did Larry Lee's, you know, 1,800 steps to prayer or whatever it was, you know, I bought those two. We know all these things because we know what we've been taught. But I want to encourage you today, don't look back at the good old days and set up a tent and camp there. But look back and see the memorials that were set up there. God did this. God did that. Oh, he saved me. Oh, he saved our marriage. <laughs> I remember we were married seven years one time. That was a long time ago. That was 33 years ago. And somebody said, somebody was, they had just met us, you know, and they're like, how long have you guys been married, you know? And Jim told them, uh, we've been married seven years. It's been the best four years of my life. <laughs> because the first three were not too nice. Because we didn't, we didn't know Jesus. And he came in and he radically changed us. And he changed, he changed us so much that we weren't the same people that we married. Praise the Lord. Amen. God's done so much for us. He's brought us into place, places that we never imagined. He took, he took a, little, a little couple like us that had no, nothing, nothing uh, interesting, nothing spectacular, nothing unusual about us. We had a bad start. Things were hard. We come from broken homes. He grew up as a foster kid. All these different things that uh, I grew up in a home. My mom was an alcoholic, and she was not a happy person. Um, and he set our feet upon a rock, and we have a trail of memorials behind us of everything that God has done. And we're not finished. So we're not going to live back there. We're going to look at those and we're going to say, God, thank you for what you've done. And I'm looking to the future. And God said, in a little while, you're going to see some of these things in a little while. So I encourage you this morning, my friends, in a little while, you hold on and you hold on tight. Because in a little while, we're going to see the things that God has promised. And there are some things that are getting ready to bust wide open. Amen. And right now, the, the enemy is trying to wear us down. Because if he does, he'll be able to get us out of that place and that position that we need to be in in a little while. Yes. Amen? Amen? Do you believe it? Yes. Do you receive it? Yes. All right. Would you stand up, please? And we'll pray, and then you can, then you can turn it off. You know, there are times when I just have a word to share, and it's just like one of my favorite things to preach or whatever, you know, and that's kind of fun. And there are times when... Uh, God just really begins to speak to me in the night season, and I hear these things. And so I want to tell you with all confidence, and I am not in any way, uh, you know, touting my own ministry or anything, but I know that I know that I know that when God speaks, I hear it. And not all the time, probably, but I know this. I know that he said in a little while. I know that at the beginning of the year, he said, draw your line in the sand. And what happened? Thank God he said it, right? Amen. And so I say this to you today with, with all confidence that it's from him. And I tell you, in a little while, you're going you're gonna to see with your eyes the promise that God has made to you. Yeah. In a little while, if you don't grow weary, you will reap the harvest of the promise of God. Amen? So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the word of God because it is alive, it's powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, even dividing between the soul and the spirit. And right now, here in this place, and there are people watching and people listening, that their soul has been pressed down, oppressed, depressed, and pushed by the enemy. And today, we take the word of God... That says, do not grow weary in well-doing, because in due season you will reap if you do not grow weary. And we divide between the soul and the spirit right now in the name of Jesus. And we declare that the word of God is true. Yes. And let every man be made a liar. That the word of God will have preeminence. And the pressure that's coming upon us will fall to the wayside. That, the, that the, the memorials that we have of what God has done in the past will be 
precious reminders of his goodness and his mercy and his loving kindness and of what he will do in the future. And we thank you for that today. We receive it. We receive the word of God. We receive the strength of God. We receive the encouragement and the empowerment of God today to press on toward the high calling that we have in Christ and not grow weary in well-doing. And we do this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 And amen. Thank you very much.